Well, hello there and good morning. Today is Wednesday, February 21st, and you're watching News Channel Nebraska. My name's Eric McKay. Thank you so much for joining us. An Iowa man accused of motor vehicle homicide after a deadly weekend crash made his first court appearance yesterday. Bond was set for 35-year-old Joshua Cool, who faces multiple charges after a crash near Bennington claimed the life of one man and injured two others. Killed in the crash was 69-year-old Gary Smith of Norfolk. Two women, including Smith's wife, were hospitalized with serious injuries following the crash. Both a breathalyzer test on site and additional testing at the Douglas County Sheriff's Office indicated Cool had a blood alcohol level twice the legal limit. The Sheriff's Office says Cool already has two prior DUI convictions. A Columbus man has pleaded guilty to fatally stabbing a 77-year-old man two years ago. 30-year-old Michael Keener entered a plea deal yesterday in Platte County District Court. According to court records, Keener told officers in January of 2022 that he'd killed a man. Shortly afterward, officers kicked down the door of a home and found Larry Hodak dead in the kitchen of a Columbus residence. Keener told officers he had gone to Hodak's home to kill him. Keener had originally been charged with first-degree murder, but as a result of his plea deal, he was convicted of second-degree murder and a felony weapon count. He's scheduled to be sentenced this July. A Nebraska congressman's calling the state a top destination in the country for law enforcement officers to live, and he's now saying he's got a national recruitment plan to prove it. Brandon Axumet has more. Well, Brandon Axumet here at the Cornhusker Hotel in Lincoln, Nebraska. District 1 Senator Mike Flood just announcing a concerted effort labeled Back the Blue, where the state of Nebraska is going to share the story of why law enforcement officers should come to the state and make careers and bring their families here. And so his overall goal today was to meet with law enforcement officers from the Nebraska State Patrol and across District 1, County Sheriff's Departments and Police Divisions to talk about what are the next steps that need to be taken to bring more law enforcement officers from other states to Nebraska to make it where they wanna live and serve. Nebraska is the best state in the union to work as a law enforcement official. And our message today is to the rest of the United States that our communities are looking for good, qualified officers that are honest, that have integrity, and are in it for all the right reasons. And according to Flood, the biggest flag that Nebraska will be waving at Police Week to sell others from across the country to come serve in Nebraska is the fact that one year ago, the legislature passed a bill that will allow for free tuition for anybody whose family or dependents is in law enforcement, they have free tuition in the state of Nebraska. And according to Flood, Nebraska is the only state that offers such a benefit. The fact that we have these benefits and no other state does means that we can take our story to every state in the nation, uh, to any police officer that wants to make a lateral move. And so um, our goal today is to uh, get away from the the scraping officers from each other's agencies and uh, telling our story to the good men and women of law enforcement that live and work in communities elsewhere. And Flood concluded there is more work to be done, but in the coming weeks and months, he will continue to work with law enforcement agencies and leaders across the state to formulate a plan and get more data as that May month approaches and Police Week approaches in Washington, D.C. And by that time, the plan is to be there with a story to tell and again with the ultimate goal of bringing more law enforcement to the state of Nebraska from outside the state. I'm Brandon Axumit in Lincoln reporting, News Channel Nebraska. A carbon pipeline planned to span through Northeast Nebraska, getting a no from county commissioners yesterday. Luke Stara has more. An over 2,000 mile carbon pipeline will have to regroup after an eight and a half mile stretch was denied in Stanton County by county commissioners on Tuesday. Summit Carbon Solutions' anticipated pipeline runs over 163 miles in Nebraska, beginning in Atkinson and running through eight counties before combining with the carbon pipeline in Iowa. A carbon pipeline captures CO2 emissions from ethanol-producing plants by capturing and storing carbon dioxide in an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Summit had their conditional use permit approved at the Planning Commission last Monday. 
Project manager Brent Nee says the pipeline has 90% acquisition in Stanton County and has already paid those landowners. Commissioner Dwayne Rehack says Summit should not have paid the landowners without getting all of them on board. Go get all the people that want it and go, okay, great. But you don't get payment until everybody agrees on it. Because you guys actually threw money away now. If it doesn't go through, For sure. whatever you guys spend is throwing a waste paper basket. Those for and against the pipeline spoke to the commissioners during a public hearing, and one of the major revolving concerns was the unknown health risk the pipeline could cause residents in Stanton County. Until and unless we can be absolutely certain that this is the safest method of transporting this gas, we must not subject our populations to this pipeline. I will accept your offer of a pipeline if you can prove and guarantee in writing that it is 100% safe. Those in favor of the pipeline say the reason it's so important for the state is what it provides for the ethanol plants. The, this pipeline is probably uh, what we need to remain viable into the future. We don't know what the future holds. However, we do know what the government is pushing. After the commissioners brought up wanting to help Nebraskans instead of other states like California, Husker Ag President in Plainview, Bill Steffen, says ethanol plants in Nebraska do. And do we rely on California? Ethanol plants, unfortunately, kind of have to, which points back to the corn farmer. The U.S. Energy Information Administration says Nebraska produces the second most ethanol in the country. Commissioners say they are all for the pipeline, but Summit needs to provide more information to those affected by the pipeline in the county. They voted unanimously to deny the application and ask for more information to give the public about the project and potentially review the pipeline's path through Stanton County. The permit was denied, but Summit is able to resubmit a CUP application to the Planning Commission and, after doing so, present their plan to the Stanton County Commissioners. In Stanton, I'm Luke Stara, News Channel, Nebraska. Nebraska lawmakers took another step yesterday toward clarifying the hiring practices for seed farmers looking for corn detasslers. LB 844, introduced by State Senator Steve Erdman of Baird, would clarify in the Farm Labor Standards Act that seed corn producers are required to solicit bids from contractors who seasonally employ mostly younger workers rather than using temporary non-immigrant workers. Currently, federal law stipulates that those workers, temporary non-immigrant workers, can be hired when there's an insufficient workforce. That's something Erdman says is not currently the case in Nebraska. He says the bill will protect Nebraska's younger workforce. The bill advanced to a second round debate on a 36 to nothing vote. Community and state leaders broke ground yesterday on a multi-million dollar expansion at Epley Airfield. Construction officially underway on a new airport terminal which will double the size of the current one and create one centralized TSA security checkpoint. The project being paid for in part thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed in 2021. Lawmakers yesterday said that investment will pay dividends for the whole state in the future. This is going to have an impact for four or five more decades. Five million people flew through this airport last year. It's going to be six million soon. We'll be seven million. We're going to be helping people see their families, do business. The new terminal is expected to be ready by 2028, while the ongoing terminal drive construction project is slated to be finished next year. A total of 46 restaurants in Omaha are at risk of closure. The Douglas County Health Department said earlier this month that any establishments that hadn't paid for their food and drink permits by February 15th. In a list issued by the department yesterday, 46 restaurants were on the list. The department said last week it would begin closures as early as last Friday. A Douglas County Health Director Lindsay Hughes says the closures are intended to keep the public's food safe. The Hall County Emergency Center says they've been responding more effectively of late, thanks in part to bilingual dispatchers. Ana Ruth Lugo Mejia has more. Everyone knows what number to dial when there's an emergency, but who is it on the other line? Uh, this is where the help starts. This is where the rescue begins, and this is where uh, the mission to assist people in their emergency 
begins. Hall County Emergency Management Director John Rosenwund says dispatchers play an integral part in public safety. He says they receive around 90 911 calls per day, totaling around 75,000 calls every year. Dispatchers go through rigorous training to handle the calls and calmly provide aid to people in need. The scenarios they encounter range from accidents to walking people through CPR to talking to someone through delivering a baby. And there's no guarantee the person calling speaks English. I always wanted to pursue something in law enforcement, and so this was a great opportunity. Mariola Sanchez has worked at the 911 center for almost six years. She's one of the dispatchers that's able to communicate in English and Spanish. It makes me feel great just knowing I can help people in two different languages. Just helping others when they need the most help. We're always there to calm them down. The center always tries to have a Spanish speaker on duty. It is something Rosenlund says is of tremendous help since it eliminates the delay that comes with a translator. It's a bonus when we have some that are truly great bilingual and then they can operate effectively and quickly in Spanish as well as English. The center has a contract with the language line for 24-hour service. According to Rosenlund, Hull County has used translator in as many as 15 different languages. I think the community can be very proud of the people that work here in the 911 center. It is a tough job and it requires a lot of sacrifice and it requires a lot of personal sacrifice on the dispatcher's part. Uh, but they're good at what they do. In Grand Island, Ana Ruth Lugo Mejia, New Channel, Nebraska. Those applying for American citizenship can expect higher fees for the process. On April 1st, the cost of the application to naturalize climbing about 19%. The cost of a green card, the first step towards citizenship, jumping as well. More than 9 million permanent residents in the United States are eligible to apply for U.S. citizenship. That's according to the Office of Homeland Security. The naturalization application forms called an N-400. It costs $640 for the paper application or $725 with the fingerprint fee. The cost of both will jump to $760 on April 1st. Immigration attorneys are urging all who are planning to apply for citizenship to consider submitting the application before the costs go up. Some students in central Nebraska getting a chance to plan for their future after high school. Over 80 students filed into the Bosselman Conference Center at Fonner Park in Grand Island yesterday for junior internship days. The event featured Tri-City professionals giving presentations on career paths that can start at Grand Island Senior High's different career academies. Students say it gives them a chance to focus on their future they may not have taken otherwise. I never really gave it any thought by myself and the fact that my like school makes me put thought into it really helps so that way like I don't have to do it on my own and I have like the extra help of the teachers. The event held as part of Career and Technical Education Month at Grand Island Senior High. President Joe Biden has canceled another $1.2 billion of student loan debt this latest round of relief impacts nearly 153,000 borrowers who were enrolled in a new repayment plan the administration launched in August. The saving on a valuable education plan known as SAVE erases remaining federal student loan balances for those who originally borrowed $12,000 or less and have made payments for at least 10 years. Since taking office, Biden has canceled nearly $138 billion of federal student loan debt for nearly 4 million borrowers. For those students who've hit a roadblock filling out the federal financial aid forms for the 2024-25 school year, there is a workaround. Roughly 2% of FAFSA applicants have not been able to complete their financial aid forms because their parents don't have social security numbers. But the immigration status of the student's parents shouldn't be a barrier, according to a U.S. representative. The Education Department says it's a glitch, among a few other glitches in the system, and they're working on fixing the problem. In the meantime, students can now at least fill out the form and actually submit it incomplete until the issue is fully resolved next month. Economic developers face a different set of challenges from 20 years ago as they try to help their communities grow. That was the message to a Southeast Nebraska Economic Development Group yesterday. Doug Kennedy has more. 
Director of the Nebraska Department of Economic Development, Casey Baylitz, told members of Gage County Growth Enterprise that some new priorities are emerging in Nebraska. 20 years ago, we would never have dreamed of talking about child care as an economic development organization. But today, clearly, that is a core economic development issue. Housing, similarly. We would never have talked about that as, uh, as an economic development or, or chamber organization. The organization known as Engage held their annual meeting at the Southeast Community College Academic Excellence Center on Tuesday. Baylitz said the state is refocusing on growing its own people and company assets and attracting more workers to fill available jobs. He said the state has some things going for it. The third highest percentage of people under age 18 among states. The sixth highest birth rate. He said the state has more first-year college students who come to Nebraska from other states than go elsewhere. Baylet said there are certain key factors for attracting young people who want to stay in the state for that smaller community feel. Today, every time in every survey, the top three are the same. Safety, good schools, family. Safety, good schools, family. What do we have in rural Nebraska? Safety, good schools, family. Three for three. For the first time, or at least to a larger degree than at any time in the lifetime of anyone sitting in this room, we have what they want. Engage Executive Director Rachel Krakemeyer said the local economy showed some gains this past year. We had just under $31 million of investment throughout the county. And something I am excited and, and maybe a little shocked by, as we really haven't even got our feet on the ground with housing development. We had $7.1 million investment invested into new housing construction. About $5.6 million investment was realized in two industrial park companies and a new restaurant set to come to the area. Krakemeyer said Engage and others continue to work on developing a 260-acre site for industry northwest of Beatrice. From Beatrice, Doug Kennedy, News Channel, Nebraska. The city of Norfolk discussing the future of its park system. Ryan Patti has more. Parks were the talk of the town Tuesday night at Norfolk City Council meeting. The city heard an update from Pros Consulting as well as Norfolk's Parks Department on their efforts to create a master plan. For almost a year now, the two have been working together to learn what the residents of Norfolk want to see. Well, according to a survey that the two put together and sent out to residents, the people of Norfolk want to see a completed park trail system, an indoor swimming pool area, and natural areas of wildlife habitat and more. However, what concerned most council members was how these projects would be paid for and what funding options were available to them. Now, Pros Consulting says that they didn't have an exact answer at that time, but did provide a number of avenues that the city could choose and said that they would come up with a financial plan for the city to look at in the coming months as part of the master plan. While the council is concerned about the cost, Nathan Powells with the Parks Department says nothing is set in stone at this time and that plenty of work is still being made. Reporting from Norfolk for News Channel Nebraska, I'm Ryan Pat T. Authorities are describing a tragic scene as they identify the victims of a double homicide in northeast Nebraska yesterday. Officials with the state patrol this morning say 17-year-old Curtis Strom and 49-year-old William Riffert were shot to death. It happened yesterday morning at the bowling alley in Bloomfield, which was owned by Strom. Authorities say 25-year-old Elias Reed entered the bowling alley with a shotgun and started a confrontation with Riffert that escalated from there. Preliminary investigation has shown that Reed went to the bowling alley Tuesday morning with a shotgun, initiated an argument with Mr. Riffert. He then shot Mr. Riffert moments later Reed shot Mr. Strom. Mr. Strom was not involved with the argument between Reed and Mr. Riffert, and then shortly after, Reed left the bowling alley. The shotgun was later located in a rural area outside of Bloomfield, and Reed was arrested on two charges of first degree murder and burglary. Also arrested was 27 year old Kalen Sweezy, accused of tampering with evidence. Law enforcement say this type of incident is a rarity for Knox County and has shocked the town to its core. I don't remember there being a homicide in Bloomfield for years. Um, we don't have a lot in Knox County, quite truthfully. Uh, anytime we do, to, to say it's not shocking would be an understatement because it is. 
and this isn't what human nature does. The state patrol says they're still working on a motive for the shooting. As for Reed, he has virtually no criminal history in Nebraska, save for a case in juvenile court. His initial court appearance has not yet been set. More news next. You're watching News Channel Nebraska.